Uh, I really have to marvel at the size of this audience and what it says about Dan Rather's continued popularity. Uh, you know, for those of us of a, of a certain generation uh, who grew up watching Dan report the news on CBS for 44 years, uh, I can appreciate his appeal and the indelible mark that he's, he's left on our consciousness, uh, but I, I see a, a lot of, of younger faces uh, out there uh, this evening, and you all are a testament to Dan's amazing ability still to connect with and communicate to people of all ages. Uh, Dan himself has expressed surprise at the significant impact he's had in recent months, especially uh, via social media. His identity had been so tied up with CBS over so many years that when he left the network just over a decade ago amid some controversy, he, he wasn't sure uh, what he, he'd do next. Uh, but Dan has always had a passion for reporting, and he's kept at it past his 86th birthday, which he celebrated last week. Uh, he, he has said before, and you may hear him say again this evening, that he feels quite humbled by and grateful for the many people who now follow his Facebook platform, News and Guts, which, which, which is, is named after his, uh, his production company. Uh, it's where he offers updates on current events and reflects on an array of issues. A few months ago, Politico reported that News and Guts was getting, on average, more likes, comments, and shares per post than BuzzFeed, USA Today, or CNN. Dan, Dan's, Dan's new book, uh, What Unites Us, uh, which he co-authored with Elliot Kirshner, uh, is a collection of essays. The chapters sound pretty basic, with such headings as the press, empathy, science, the environment, and public education. But Dan personalizes many of these topics by wrapping in anecdotes from his storied life while reflecting on the qualities and trends that have made our country what it is today and offering thoughts on what should be done to deal with current challenges. Dan, of course, is outspokenly patriotic, but he's also made no secret of his deep sense of alarm about Trump, about the shattering of important norms of American life, about entrenched partisanship, growing inequality, and persistent injustices. Still, he remains essentially optimistic, believing in the fundamental resilience, integrity, and honesty of Americans. And he brings a seasoned perspective and sense of balance and reason to, to a public discussion that nowadays is all too often dominated by politically motivated distortions and just plain untruths. Uh, Dan will be in conversation here this evening with Jonathan Capehart, uh, who's a member of the Washington Post's editorial board. Uh, he's been there for, for a decade now. Uh, and he's also uh, an MSNBC contributor. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dan Rather and Jonathan Capehart. So I'm just going to add a little bit more to the bio that Brad um, gave, and I'm sure everyone knows who Dan Rather is, but as a journalist, I want to, I feel the need to say this, that Dan Rather is a journalist's journalist. He worked at CBS News for 44 years, 24 of those years, you were beamed into our homes as the anchor of the CBS Evening News. And after your departure from the Tiffany Network in 2005, you kept working. Um, you're still working, as Brad talked about, and I'm sure as all of you know, the News & Guts um, um, company, the News & Guts Facebook page, your own personal Facebook page, and now your latest book, What Unites Us, Reflections on Patriotism, and that's what brings us here tonight. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of journalists, 
my age and maybe a little younger who um, have looked to you as a guidepost. Welcome to Washington. Welcome to George Washington University. Thank you very much, Yara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank so, thank you. I mean, Dan, and, and I can call you Dan, right? Please. Um, <laughs> you, your birthday was Halloween. You turned 86. And I've got two questions. Um, have you ever considered retiring? I mean, you, you've earned it. No. <laughs> no, uh, Jonathan, it's a fair question. Uh, but I like to work. Uh, I'm the son of two very hardworking parents. Uh, I really like to work, and I love this work, which is to say I've always had a passion uh, for recording news. So as long as I have my health, God's grace, and somebody will listen or read or watch, then I really do like to work. Um, and speaking of people who like to listen and read and watch, the other thing that's so fascinating is that you are wildly popular, and wildly popular with millennials. I mean, why do you think that is? Well, the honest answer is, Jonathan, I don't know. I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I say this uh, uh, humbly, not a word generally associated with present or past anchormen from television, but nonetheless, <laughs> uh, that I, I'm amazed by it. I don't understand it. As best I can make out, that when we started the Facebook page uh, with well, my co-author, uh, Elliot Kirshner, the goal was to try to give some context and perspective to the news. And when possible, and when I felt I had any experience or knowledge to put things into a historical context. So my guess is that in the havoc of the daily headlines, that some people, and I have no illusions, we have a large audience, but it's not the largest audience uh, in social media, that some people are, are looking for a, a steady, what they consider to be reliable and experienced voice. Mm -hmm. And partly because, let's face it, I've been around a few years and I've been a lot of miles <laughs> as a reporter. Uh, that's the best I can do at guessing at what the attraction is. So, um, when it comes to writing a book and releasing a book, it's not that you wake up on Monday and by Friday the book is out. Oh, no. this, this book took some planning, but it seems as though your timing could not have been more impeccable. Um, and so I'm wondering, when did the idea of this book occur to you? Was it pre-Trump getting into the race? or post-Trump getting into the race? No, it was pretty much around the time when uh, President Trump got elected okay. that we'd been thinking about the book. Uh, I had no idea that we could have the book out, frankly, this soon, uh, in 2017. But the people at Algonquin, the publisher of the book, approached me and said, listen, we've been reading your Facebook uh, pieces. Would you consider doing the book? And I said, well, certainly I would, but uh, could we get it out in 2017? And somewhat to my surprise, they said, yes, we can do it in 2017. But the answer to your question, at or about the time President uh, Trump got elected was when was the early seed of the book. Um, one of the things that I love about reading your, your book, and I have my own copy right here. Bless you. And books to me are, are living documents, so I write in them, I underline in them, I write notes. And the thing that I love about your book is from beginning to end, how much it reminded me of who we were, at, we as a nation, who we were and who we are. And I finished reading the book before Wednesday night, so you know, it was wonderful to read something from someone um, as venerable as you, reminding me that despite the situation that we're in now, that we can get through this. And so that's one of the reasons why I was wondering why, why you wrote this book. Was this to be, in a way, a salve for a hurting nation? Or was it meant to be um, 
something where people can go back and in terms of history, be reminded of who we are at a time when we're questioning who we are. Well, if you'll permit me, I've been thinking some about that because in making this book tour in a sort of desperate effort to sell the book, uh, <laughs> uh, then I'm appearing in various places. And this, this is a very common question. So with your permission and only with your permission, I'd like to read something that I typed out anticipating the question. Well, let's make this a, a democracy. Um, should, should Dan read what he wants to read? <laughs> well, thank you. Of course. Well, what I typed out was that, you know, as we have entered a, a very complicated and anxious time during this past year, uh, I've been in a reflective state. Those who know me well might say that a reflective state is rare for me, but I've been in a reflective state. <laughs> and, you know, thinking back over my life and career, I think about all the change and uncertainties that I've witnessed as a child of the Great Depression and World War II, seeing the fever of the Red Scare, the fight for civil rights, Vietnam, Watergate, 9-11, in our current moment of history. And as I've been thinking about what it means to be an American, what it means to be a patriot in the second decade of the 21st century, that really was the beginning of the idea for the book, was what is patriotism in our time? And I know that a lot of people confuse patriotism with nationalism. Mm -hmm. And one of the discussions uh, in What Unites Us is how important it is to recognize the difference between patriotism and nationalism. But those things were in my head. So I wanted to do a book that contributes to people's thinking about what patriotism is. I'm not an expert on patriotism, but as much as anything, the effort of the book is to start a conversation about patriotism and what it is in this time, and to make sure that people do understand that by dictionary definition, the difference between patriotism and nationalism. Patriotism is, of course, a deep love of country. But one key of patriotism and being a patriot is humility. Mm -hmm. We don't, if you're a, a true patriot, you don't take the view that you go around beating on your chest and saying, we're better than everybody else. We're the best, we're the strongest at the time. Uh, that you're humble enough to know that we're in search of the more perfect union you know, in the very beginning, our founding fathers in the Constitution said, uh, in order to seek a more perfect union. So that's patriotism. Nationalism carries inherent in it a certain amount of arrogance and conceit. And the danger with nationalism carried to extremes. You, have ex you can have extreme economic nationalism and also racial nationalism, as in Aryan nationalism. And we know this. And one of the things I want to do with what unites us is remind people of the historical perspective that follows. That extreme economic nationalism in the 1920s led to the Great Depression. And Aryan nationalism, racial nationalism, led to Adolf Hitler. Now, I'm not suggesting we are at this point. I am suggesting that with the authoritarian nature of the present presidency. Sometimes it's only a short distance to extreme nationalism, which can lead to nativism, and then that can lead to tribalism. And in our great historical, never before in the history of mankind experiment that is the United States, that tribalism, if we ever descend into tribalism, then we're through as the land of the free and the home of the brave. In, in your chapter, entitled Steady. And for those of you with the book, I'm going to read from page 249 and 259 because you have this um, analogy of a pendulum, and this fits in with what you're, you're speaking about. Um, on 249, it's your, you've had your rheumatic fever and you've been listening to Edward R. Murrow on the radio and the, the wars, you're listening to him reporting from London and you write, I had witnessed the great pendulum of personal and national fortune swing in the right direction, 
and I was armed with the lesson of my father, my hero Murrow, and my country, stay steady. And then, uh, 10 pages later, you write, the pendulum of our great nation, in, now we're sort of present day, the pre pendulum of our great nation seems to have swung toward conceit and unsteadiness once again, but it is in our power to rest it back. Our government is there to serve us, not the other way around. And when I read that, um, and it was just after the results on Tuesday of Virginia and New Jersey and the Minneapolis City Council race and the mayor's race in Helena, Montana and Charlotte. And I'm wondering, what do those results, um, what do those results tell you in terms of that pendulum swing? Is, this, is, is what happened on Tuesday the beginning of that pendulum starting to swing back from what you wrote of our great nation swinging toward conceit and unsteadiness once again? I think there are indications that it is the pendulum swinging back. The metaphor I sometimes use is an ebb and flow to American politics. That sometimes we go, we lurch in one direction to the left, if you want to call it that. Other times we lurch to the right, as we did during the Red Scare time. But inevitably, over our history, that ebb and flow steadies itself more or less in the broad middle. And I do think that by any reasonable analysis, a reading of the results of Tuesday gives an indication that the country having swung very far to the right is in the process of swinging a bit more toward the middle. Uh, you and I know from having covered politics a long time that overnight's a long time in politics. Mm -hmm. A week is forever. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly people are talking about whether well, it may be a democratic groundswell for 2018. I think it's early, too early to say that. And I would tell you quite honestly, personally, I think that some Democrats are celebrating a little too early. They are doing their equivalent of moonwalking in the end, <laughs> in the end zone. <laughs> right. Uh, but too early for that. But in answer to your question, I think that the results of this, not just the results themselves, but the margin Mm -hmm. by which swung, and within that, most importantly, the difference of the vote this time in the suburbs, not just of Virginia, but around the country, the suburbs, which were a key, one of the keys to Trump's victory, are swinging back the other way. So yes, I think there are early indications that the pendulum may be swinging back the other way. Things to watch. A, a, a very serious war overseas could change things, could change the public mood very mm -hmm. quickly. And most people in the end vote their pocketbooks. Right. So if, if the economy continues to boom, continues to do quite well, that will gravitate to Trump's advantage. If the economy it cools off or starts going the other way, uh, that would be to his disadvantage. But, you know, I, one of the things that I hope people will take from uh, what unites us is that the general overall steadiness of the American people is one of our strengths. Look, we have weaknesses and we have vulnerabilities. We're far from perfect. But overall in the main, any study of our history shows you that we may go through a period of great division, such as during the 1960s, mm -hmm. divided over the war, race riots in some of our major cities, uh, we were certainly divided in a disastrous civil war, but we got through it and steadied ourselves. And the spirit of this book is a hope that we can remember that. And if it needs to be said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature and by experience. And I'm absolutely convinced that while this is a, a very anxious time and in many ways a perilous time for the country, we are gonna get through this. It may be a long, dark valley to get through. We're going to get through it, and we will come out the other end in the medium and long run better off. I'm absolutely convinced of it. Um, thank, you. thank you. Bring you back, bring you back to patriotism. In that, um, for those of you following along, page 12, chapters. Uh, what is patriotism? Um, this line that you wrote um, made me think of another controversy 
that we've been dealing with. And you write, I see my love of country imbued with a responsibility to bear witness to its faults. And when I read that line, I was instantly brought to the football players in the NFL who are, who are taking a knee, the young protesters around the country who've taken to the streets in the Black Lives Matter movement, the women who flooded the streets of America on January 21st, the day after Trump's inauguration to protest um, his incoming policies, the people who took to the streets the week after that when right. he proposed the Muslim ban. And when it comes to the NFL protests, you have the president tweeting, speechifying, saying that those people doing that, bearing witness to our nation's faults, are un-American, they don't love the flag, they don't love the anthem, what do, you, what do you make of that? Talk about that. Well, I will talk about it, in, uh, but with a short preface. I stand for the national anthem, and without apology, I stand with my hand over the heart, and I generally at least mouth the words and sometimes actually sing the words. That's what's within me. That's what I feel when I hear the national anthem. Having said that, I respect greatly those who have had different experiences whose conscience dictates a, a different course. And they have every right to dissent. In fact, dissent, which I talk about in what unites us, dissent over the long haul has been one of, those, one, of, one of our strengths of the country. Mm -hmm. Because time and again, <laughs> time and again, dissenters have, in the beginning, they're called unpatriotic. They're called, you know, against the military, against the flag, what have you. But over time, they, when justice is on their side, then people come around and say, you know what? The radical of yesterday was the prophet of tomorrow. We've seen this time and again, maybe one example I'd use is with women's suffrage. Those women who spoke out seeking the vote for women in the 19th century, you can go back and read what was said about them at the time. They were radical. Uh, they were unpatriotic. Uh, they were trying to undermine the culture and society. Well, it took a while. It took too long. But by the time we got, before we were one-fifth finished with the 20th century, we finally, finally got one of the vote. That's just one example. The Civil Rights Movement led by uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in the early 60s. Dr. King was accused of being a communist. He was seen as an extreme radical. Uh, those were among the milder things. However, by continuing to, to stand strong for nonviolent protest in the face of injustice, we wound up by the mid-1960s passing some of the most important domestic legislation in the country. So the point being, that we should be very cautious of criticizing dissent. Conscionable dissent is patriotic. And the president, and I'm, I'm trying to be as respectful of the office of the presidency I can, I can, but this effort to shift the public perception of these dissenters as unpatriotic and against the military and against the flag is frankly unconscionable, and that's what's unpatriotic, to cast the case. In, in fact, you, you write on page 35, dissent is doubly necessary to resist a slide into greater autocracy. You know, you said something just a second ago about uh, your respect. Your respect for the office was holding you back from going full bore. So I'll go. I'll go maybe halfway into full bore. <laughs> to me, as an American, and certainly as an African American, watching the president of the United States on a Tuesday in August in the lobby of his eponymous tower on Fifth Avenue, give moral equivalence, make a moral equivalency between the Nazis, white supremacists, 
and the bigots marching on Charlottesville with the people who came out to counter protest um, was a bridge too far for me. Well, that it I, was for me as well. That I thought that in that one action, Donald Trump ceded the moral authority of the presidency by doing that. Am I, am I, am I going too far no. in thinking that? No, no, definitely not. Okay. No. And, and this, this is exactly why in what unites us, these reflections on patriotism, I didn't want to make it a screed against the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. And his name is not mentioned anywhere, not at all. anywhere in the book. It was to, to have a broader discussion, to put, again, to use the two words, give, to give some context and perspective to what's going on in the national leadership, that this was unconscionable, what the president did, uh, in making this moral equivalency and sending the proverbial dog whistles and wink winks to the likes of the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis. Think about that for a moment. And my hope for the book is I, I hope many of the people who still support President Trump will read the book, not because I'm trying to convince them that they're wrong about some of Trump's policies, but to understand, which I think all of us need to understand, this is not normal. This is unique to this presidency, what's happening here. And I'll give you a specific example. Mm -hmm. Here's a historical context. I want to take you back to sometime in the early 70s. Some neo-Nazis uh, paraded in Skokie, Illinois. You can go back and read in the archives. But they paraded. At that time, it was the president was Richard Nixon during that time. It was unthinkable that the president would say anything that tried to make some moral equivalency with it. Now, that was in the early 70s in the presidency of Richard Nixon. It, Richard Nixon wouldn't touch it. I mean, it was just unthinkable that a president would have anything that could be read by, from any viewpoint, giving approval or giving moral equivalence to those neo-Nazis, you know, deep anti-Semites in Skokie. Now we go forward to 2018. To, to 2017 to the present year. And this, this is why we have to recognize as a people, whether we're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Mugwump, whatever we are, <laughs> to send a very strong signal that with the President of the United States, who is, let us remember, he is not just head of government, but under our system, he's also head of state. And by the way, this goes back to my saying to you that I have great respect for the office of the presidency. I was the chief White House correspondent for CBS News for 10 years. And I can tell you, and I, I, I don't want this to sound sophomoric or sloppy or something, but I really felt a, a great sense of pride and responsibility every morning I walked through those gates, thinking about our history, thinking about what the office of the presidency is. Sometimes our foreign friends don't understand, sometimes we don't understand ourselves, that we have a form of government where the president represents, he is head of state with all of that conveys, as well as head of government. So when I say I respect the office, but you never met anybody that felt stronger that the, the presidency, because it is a combined head of state and head of government, has the heaviest responsibility of any leader in the world, not because of its strength and the ability to start an atomic war, but what, what the ideal that it, it represents. Mm -hmm. And that fortunately, we as Americans, we never have thought, a majority of us don't think now, and I'm convinced won't think in the future. We don't view our president as some descendant of a sun god or some, you know, some king. He is another citizen who's been elevated to the highest honor we have. And that carries with it a tremendous responsibility. And the criticism of, of President Trump, which I think is most valid, is the tone he has brought to the presidency. There's nothing noble in what he's doing. That people want a president to have at least some symbols of nobility because we'd like to think of ourselves as a noble people on a noble experiment to prove 
that a multi-religious, multi-racial, multi-ethnic uh, society can hold itself together. So this is why it's so important to recognize that this is a unique period. When people say, well, we've had presidents who don't like the press before, that's true. But we've never had a president who so personally, directly, and unrelentingly attack individual reporters, mm -hmm. reporters at large, by saying they are, quote, enemies of the people. I suggest to you this is a very dangerous phrase to use, that the press are enemies of the people. And he's attacked institutions of the press and threatens institutions of the press. We've never had anything like it. And when people say, well, remember President Nixon, the Nixon administration, President Nixon didn't like the press at all. And he did make efforts to intimidate the press including individual reporters, and yes, including this individual reporter. But by and large, he used surrogates. If you remember, for example, mm -hmm. his vice president, Spiro Agnew, was his hit man on racial policy. That the president himself, did, very rarely, I can't remember a single time, when he personally attacked individual reporters, mm -hmm. or when he personally attacked some institution, he might complain, but not attack it. That's, uh, and this is key, and the reason that it's key I hear people say all the time, well, naturally, Dan, rather, you're a journalist, so you would complain about the president, complain about the press. No, with these kind of attacks, of course it's important to our reputations and you can say our, our living as journalists, but it's vital to the country we understand that this has to be unacceptable because a free, a truly free and independent, fiercely independent press when necessary is the red beating heart of freedom and democracy. If we don't have it, we will not have the system of government we have now. You, so, so given what you just said, you said a lot of things, and I'll put the press piece off to the side, and what you were talking about before, like we've never seen this, we have never seen this before, this, the tone and tenor coming out of the Oval Office, coming out of the mouth and Twitter fingers of the President of the United States. Um, we have been, well, people have been lauding member, Republican members of Congress like Senator Corker, Senator Flake, Senator McCain, who have stepped out and spoken very bluntly about the President. Two of them are retiring. And, and one is um, facing his own mortality. But it makes me wonder about what responsibility Republicans have to emulate what Corker, Flake, and McCain are doing. And I thought of this when I read this line in the Patriotism chapter where you asked the question, do you stay and try to change the church from within or leave the church? What would you advise Republicans to do? Well, first of all, uh, I, wouldn't, I would, would not place myself in the position of advising anybody. That I've made so many mistakes and <laughs> have so many wounds, I wouldn't do it. However, I take your question, and it's a serious question. But this is a question of conscience, especially for Republicans, because they are in the majority, and the president is a member of their party. There has been, and I haven't heard this word used much, but again, let's talk directly. Mm -hmm. There's been some cowardice in the Republican Party. It's a cowardice. <laughs> no. It's a harsh word, and I understand that. The cowardice comes from any number of Republicans who are saying to themselves, I hate what the president's saying. I hope to, I hate the tone and tenor mm -hmm. of what he's saying. I hate the impression he has left of his, about his style of leadership, but they haven't broken out to say so. As you rightly point out, it's one thing for retiring senators to say it, it's another for another senator who's facing his mortality to say it. But it takes, it takes courage, it takes guts to say what your conscience tells you and to do the right thing. I will say this, that Democrats sometimes when they've been in the majority have faced, if not identical, at least similar questions. But right now, again, the Republicans are in the majority. Mm -hmm. That history is going to judge very harshly if 
those Republicans who continued to, by their silence, acquiesce in the tone and tenor of this presidency. I don't consider that a partisan political statement. I don't intend it to be that. And I don't want to get into an argument about ide ideology. We're talking about our country, folks. And we're talking about what kind of country we are becoming. And because they're in the majority, the Republicans have the heaviest responsibility to speak out when their conscience whispers to them that they should. Thus far, very few have done so. You know, I was going to move. I was going to move on to to another part, but this you have a, a chapter on on empathy, and there are a couple of lines lines here. Again, like you say, you don't talk about President Trump at all. You don't mention his name. His name's not in the book. But in the empathy chapter on page one and one, you write, "I worry that our nation today suffers from a deficit of empathy." And this is especially true of many in positions of national leadership. And then two pages later, <laughs> you write, one often finds the greatest lack of empathy in those who were born lucky. Well, I think it's, it's very clear who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like really clear. No, but, you know, I don't read, I'm not trying to be clever about this. But again, you know, I'm trying to elevate the level of discussion. Mm -hmm. And one of the, part of the spirit of what unites us is to say, we need to be much more civil in our discussions. One can argue, perhaps I haven't been as civil on this stage tonight as I should have been. But you know, we, we all know what's happening. By the way, the empathy chapter may be my own favorite chapter in the book. Because we are, as Americans, again, emphasizing we have our faults, we're not perfect. But one of the things we've had through our history, it's a mark of the American character to be empathetic. And we've seen marvelous, really wonderful demonstrations of it recently in the wake of the great hurricanes, particularly the one Harvey in Houston. What we saw is immediately, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, neighbor helping neighbor, people pitching in, not waiting for the, uh, the county or state or federal government to come to pitch in and help. A demonstration of empathy uh, that stands as an example. We are an empathetic people. What's happened very recently, and I will say has been building for some years, is the idea somehow that compassion is enough. And here again, I, I refer to the dictionary. There's a difference between compassion and empathy. Mm -hmm. And compassion is, I feel sorry for people. Empathy is saying, in effect, it's not feeling sorry for people. I understand, and I'm trying hard to understand what they're going through, and there, but for the grace of God, go I. That's empathy. And it is a, a hallmark of our history, a hallmark of our character, it's, there has been an attempt to sort of squeeze it out of our national character, but it isn't going to work. You know, in the, in the um, you tell the story about when you were growing up and the families that all lived around, and the, the one family that lived in basically a hut. Um, and at one point you said to your mother something to the effect that you, fe you felt sorry yeah. For, uh, for the neighbors, and your mother snapped at you. What did she say to you? Well, what she said was a version of what I said earlier. She said, no, we don't feel sorry for them. We understand. We understand what they're going through, and we try to help them. I want to bring, um, I know I put the, the, the press portion of your uh, previous answer to the side, and I want to bring it back because the, a free press and free and unfettered press is one of the, the legs in the stool of our democracy. But you, you have an entire chapter devoted to books. And for you, books is maybe the second and third leg of that stool because of what books represent. And I know you want to, there's a particular, you want to talk about that part. You want to read a part. Well, um, I do. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, that, yeah. No, but, you know, I love books. I was very lucky. I was introduced to books uh, uh, early and introduced to the Houston Heights Library. 
when I was six, no more than seven years old. And it was one of the transforming events of my life. But you know, again, we tend to overlook how important books have been in our history. And in this chapter, uh, I, I will read, I hope I'll read a little better this time. But this is from page uh, 145. If you travel to Washington, D.C., you can see our country's debt to the power of books in the very heart of our federal city, next to the Supreme Court and facing the great dome of the Capitol is the Library of Congress. I find the symbolism inspiring. Three institutions that write, judge, and archive the words and thoughts that allow our nation to function. The Library of Congress was founded in 1800 with a modest mission, a reference resource for Congress. But that changed after the British burned Washington during the War of 1812, and the original collection was lost. In response, Thomas Jefferson offered to sell his own library to the U.S. government. His collection of books was considered one of the finest in the New World, containing thousands of volumes on almost every topic imaginable, not just law, statecraft, and history, but also the sciences, philosophy, and the arts. To those who argued that such a desperate set of works was unnecessary for a library of Congress, Jefferson responded, quote, there is in fact no subject to which a member of Congress may not have occasion to refer. And I go on to write uh, uh, as part of this chapter. You know, growing up in working class Houston, I had never heard of the Library of Congress or the great rotunda at the University of Virginia. But my local branch of the Houston Public Library showed me that books were not only important, they were also objects of beauty. The stone building had high ceilings, big windows, and a red tile roof. The Italian style architecture made the library seem worlds away from my Hodge Problem neighborhood. I was pleased that it later became a recognized historical landmark. Even as a high school student, I would often prolong my walk home from school to go by the library. It may sound sappy, but the building inspired me to dream of exploring a world greater than the world I knew. And don't put it away yet. <laughs> don't put it away yet. Um, because you, and that wasn't even my favorite part of this chapter. And I was going to read it myself, but you need to read it because, um, out loud I mean. <laughs> because the words that you say in the last paragraph of the book's chapter, page 153. Right, right. Take is a second so, to get to it. Is so stirring. And while he's finding the page, like I said. 153. My, I underline in my books. It's so, th this is some great, great um, language here. Please read that last paragraph. The last paragraph on page 153. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is good, folks. <laughs> Our nation was born in a spirit of fierce debate. Our founding fathers had sharp political differences, but they were almost all deep readers, writers, and thinkers. When they set about to create a modern republic, they would into their libraries and pulled out the works of philosophers such as John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. They consulted the Greeks, the Romans, the philosophers of Europe, and the Bible. They revered the power of the written word and how it enabled a nation free from the whims of a king. As John Adams wrote, a republic, quote, is a government of laws and not of men, unquote. A government of laws is a government of reason and a government of books. That was true at our founding, and we must ensure that it remains a hallmark of our future. 
I mean, come on. I'm so glad I got you to read that paragraph because it gave me chills to read it um, in the book and underline it vigorously. Um, but it's also wonderful to be reminded of the man, in this case, the men who set about the noble experiment of creating this country. Um, not perfect, um, not a perfect exercise, but they created a document and a nation that makes it possible for someone like me and someone like you to sit across from each other and have an, an open um, dialogue about who we are as a people. Before I open it up to, um, I'm gonna ask you one last question, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience. There are two standing microphones, because the lights are in my eyes, I'm assuming that one is over here, and one is over here. Um, I ask that you make sure that your question is short, and that it is indeed a question, because <laughs> we want as many people to ask questions as possible. Also, um, no speeches. If you do launch into a speech, I don't mean to be rude, I'm gonna have to cut you off and I'll be rude doing it. <laughs> so, the last question I wanna ask you before we throw it over to Q&A. Mrs. Simmons, principal of William G. Love Elementary School. And you have um, this, <laughs> this moment that made me laugh. Um, it's in the public education chapter on page 195. You write, sometimes to both break the ice and make a point, she would explain, quote, you know, there's tough. There's street tough. Street, there's street tough. Heights tough. And then there is prison tough, end quote. After a pause, she would invariably add, in a voice I can still remember, quote, and trust me, friends, I can be prison tough and beyond if I have to be, <laughs> end quote. Who was this lady? <laughs> well, she was one of the most important people of, uh, of my life, certainly uh, outside of Blood Cannon and even including Blood Cannon. Uh, Mrs. Simmons was of a different era. Remember, <laughs> I was in elementary school in the 1930s. Uh, this was public school. I never saw the inside of anything as a student other than a public school, including the college. I went to tiny Sam Houston State Teachers College. But Mrs. Hicks was, uh, uh, in the scheme of things at that time, she was allowed by the school system to be a kind of dictator at the elementary school. She was a benevolent dictator. <laughs> but she chose the teachers, she selected the teachers, she was a nuclear power plant of energy. She came into every classroom at least once every day just to check in. And one might say, well, she was micromanaging, but we didn't see it that way. And I'll give you a specific example of why she was such a strong educator that when you had your multiplication tables, when your teacher thought you had mastered the multiplication tables, then you went one by one alone to Miss Simmons' office. <laughs> and you recited the multiplication tables. And if it was not perfect, then you went back and started again. Another example was that Mrs. Simmons, many people in our neighborhood did not have a telephone. I'm not talking about a cell phone, they had no telephone. Remember, this mm -hmm. is a depression, that was a long time ago. But she would send notes home to parents. And if you misbehaved in school, particularly if you did it very often, she'd send a note home and she expected the parents to come to school. Now, I recognize that this has been a long time ago and I'm not suggesting that every principal at every school in our country can do as Mrs. Simmons did. I will say that she had such a deep level of commitment to every student in the school that she still is, to me, a shining example of what a school teacher or a school administrator can be. And with that. Wow, Dan, uh, we've got a lot of people. 
Um, and so I'm going, I am going to alternate. And so I'm going to, wow. I'm going to start with the guy in the tie. Hey, Mr. Rather, when you began your television career at CBS News, there were only three sources of news on television. We've evolved into a society where news is presented in so many different platforms and there are so many different flavors of news available. And when one, when one event happens, it can be interpreted and presented in so many different ways. What do you make of that in terms of how we move forward in processing what the truth is and what news means to different audiences? Well, the technology is trained, has changed tremendously. The, the number of platforms for news uh, has multiplied tremendously. It's very hard to compare when I, the time when I started at CBS News with today. But what hasn't changed is the fundamental responsibility of the press. What is it that we journalists, those journalists who are trying to do quality journalism and integrity, what is it, what is our role? The role is to try to be as, insofar as it's humanly possible, to get to the truth or as close to the truth as is humanly possible, to be witnesses, to bear witness, to establish facts. We're not talking about alternative facts, facts. <laughs> and to get as close as we can. That part of the job of journalists hasn't changed with all of the other changes that have happened. That's suppo when we're at our best, acknowledging that we, and I include myself, are not always at our best, but when we're at our best, that is the job. Now, here, as we move forward in the, uh, the post-digital age, it's more difficult for a news consumer today than it was during that time when I started at CBS News in 1962. It's a greater challenge for news consumers. It's a greater challenge to get a wide variety of news sources and compare them, not be in a silo and just want to hear an echo of what you've already decided. You know, I find with many people, this has been true over the years, but now it's more dangerous. There are people who take the view, you know, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. In a society such as this, ours, this is dangerous. So there is a lot of good reporting being done today, but you have to search a little harder to find it. And I will say, having said that, that one of the problems for those of us in journalism and for journalistic in institutions is this that the old business model that supported the kind of reporting that we had in the 1960s and 70s, that business model is, if not dead, die. Nobody, with very few exceptions, has come up with a new business model that can advance, that can finance the kind of coverage that CBS News provided, for example, in the 1960s and others did. That at, at two examples. At a time when we need more really high quality international reporting, what used to be called foreign news, we were in fact getting less because it's one of the more expensive forms of journalism to have on the ground people who live in foreign countries. So there's been a shrinkage of first class international reporting. The second example I would use is deep digging investigative reporting. Again, it's among the most expensive forms of journalism and there was a time when a place like CBS News financed a lot of it. Not so much anymore. There are some, I'm happy to say there's been somewhat of a revival of investigative reporting in recent days. But my point here is, with the old business model for not only newspapers, but also in many ways for electronic journalism, gone and nobody coming up with a new business model American journalism is in what I would call a kind of interregnum. It's a word from the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, but that's the word. And interregnum <laughs> is the, the old order is gone, the new order is not yet in place. Now, and this is affecting the quality of news that in general that you get and is something to, you know, to consider. I have no idea what the business model will be going forward. I, I, my optimism tells me we will find one. But news consumers need to understand 
that among the pressures on journalistic institutions and individual journalists, one of the problems is what I just outlined, that it's, it's a shrinking of coverage as the resources available for coverage get more and more limited as a general proposition. Thank you for the question. Question here. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you for coming here. We're very happy to have you. Um, I'm confident that journalists, journalists who have you know grown up with you, um, and if we're smart consumers of uh, news, we can find you know the truth in journalism. But what do you say to um, our leaders at the highest level have what I would say like a pliable relationship with the truth? Okay, and I'm worried about my kids, I'm worried about our institutions, separation of powers, when we're seeking truth and it's not, we can't find it. It's, you know, there are lies, there are, you know, I'm confused and everything seems just so irrational. So how do we reconcile with our leaders who cannot seem to speak the truth, facts? I uh, thank you for the question. Help me out here. I'm not hearing as well. Um, I think she's asking. We're, we have leaders who have a, I think you, the word you use, a pliable relationship with the truth. And how does she and how do other Americans contend with that when they're, they're looking and trying to understand what's happening, but their very leaders you can't trust that they're going to tell you the truth. Did I have that right? Yes. Well, okay, thanks. <laughs> this is, is, is a growing and ongoing problem, what you in general describe. Because, and again, let's have it stated straight out what the situation is. You have an administration in many ways that seeks to move us to a post-truth political era a, a post-fact political era. And the, given the power of the presidency, this is a powerful force to c c convince people, well, you know, truth doesn't matter all that much. And truth is fungible, and facts are fungible. Now, this places a heavy responsibility on the citizenry, on each individual citizen. And again, I'm going to say I have tremendous confidence in the American people. My experience as a reporter is to have great confidence in the audience. Having said that we Americans have a lot of flaws, Americans in general are very good at separating brass tacks from bullshine. <laughs> and, and while it's a confusing time, and as I said before, it presents in some ways a greater challenge for each individual citizen. I do not think this effort to convince the public, well, truth doesn't matter, it doesn't count. What only thing that counts is what I, your maximum leader, tells you. I don't think it's going to get very far, and I don't want to extrapolate too much, but I think the results of Tuesday's election was a repudiation of what we said earlier. That tone and style of the presidency is not playing well and will not play well over the long pole with most Americans. Thank you. Question here. Um, hi, I'm just letting you know we have time for four more questions. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, four more questions. So one, two, three, four. Okay, go ahead. All right. Quick. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Rather. My question is kind of related to that. Uh, there's some discussion now whether or not news organizations should cover the White House press briefing, um, covering question. it to uh, make the leaders answer questions of the press, but also with the alternative facts that there may be just a propaganda effort with that press briefing. I was wondering what your perspective on that would be. It's a great question. Should reporters well, cover the uh, briefing? Again, I'm having a little trouble here, but I think I understand the question. Look, the, the White House press briefings, for all of their flaws, and for the fact that sometimes it's a theater of the absurd, <laughs> or, or to use a different metaphor, it's a kind of kabuki dance. But one, I do think it's important to continue the White House press briefings because it is an opportunity for individual reporters and various press institutions 
to ask the tough question, and what is frequently more important, ask a tough follow-up question, and to, in effect, force the president's spokesman either to answer the question or to make it clear that she, in this case, is not answering the question. But I do think, because they in the present era, that these briefings are covered uh, on a widespread basis and covered live, it's important for you, the individual citizen, to understand that with the modern presidency, and this didn't begin with Donald Trump, but he has carried it to an extreme we've never seen before, that the White House press briefing is designed by the White House to be a straight-out propaganda operation. It is to tell the actions and history of the Trump administration as told to Hans Christian Anderson. <laughs> but, but, you know, there's so many good reporters these days, and the good White House reporters, and I think the public understands this, but on the off chances, the good White House, best among the White House reporters, they come prepared to ask the tough question, to ask the tough follow-up question, and they, they leave the briefing room and say to themselves, okay, that's what they, the Trump administration, says is going on. Now, let me and my organization make telephone calls and start talking to people to find out what's really going on. And that is a very important role of the press, that it's not original with me, but one of my favorite definitions of news is news is what the public needs to know that someone somewhere, usually some powerful person, doesn't want the public to know. That's news. Most of the rest is just advertising and propaganda. <laughs> Question here. Uh, Mr. Rather, I very much enjoyed following along this summer when you took your road trip with your grandson. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm curious to know what uh, lessons you took home after uh, uh, taking a road trip through middle America with a college kid. Help. Wanted to know what lessons you learned taking the road trip uh, with your grandson, with a college kid. Well. Uh, thank you for noticing that. <laughs> no, I, I took this trip uh, as an effort, uh, frankly, as for some days of bonding with my oldest grandson, Martin. He had never seen uh, Mount Rushmore, and we drove from Texas to Mount Rushmore and spent, you know, day after day driving right through the heart land of the country. Wonderful experience. One of the things I learned uh, from Martin was how interested he, he was, and, and he tells me this is reflective of his friends as well, how interested he was in having a historical perspective on what's happened today. Some of the things we talked about before, he's very interested to know how the country had handled times of stress and division before. And we talked some about the 1960s and how divided the country was. We talked some about the, what I call the Red Scare years and McCarthyism. So I was, I was interested, interested that he was that interested in a historical perspective. And perhaps more importantly, he's a senior in college now. He said it's something that his fellow students discuss very often. The other thing I learned is that try as Martin did and try as he does, and as badly as I want to understand it, Hip-hop music and rap is still a challenge for me. You're not alone. <laughs> Thank you. Question here. As a high school teacher, I feel that teachers have so many responsibilities today, and yet education as a whole keeps getting disparaged by the administration and the powers that be. Um, especially with the new tax bill, and I'm sure we've all heard a lot about that. You have a very deep relationship with education, sir, and I would like to hear more about your take on that and where you feel it is going. You got a whole chapter on that, your take on education. Yes. Well, I'm glad you raised it because there is a whole chapter on education uh, in what unites us. And the reason there's a whole chapter is because 
I, I do want to remind myself and remind everybody how important a dedication to education uh, has been in the development of the country and how important it is going forward. Now, I have a prejudice, and I like to put my prejudices out front. I am prejudiced toward public schools. I'm a product of public schools. No, I have tremendous respect, great respect, for private schools, charter schools, religious schools. But public schools are part of the very essence of the country. They are a, a great part of what has brought us to being the world's only ranking superpower, superpower economically and militarily. Now, as you rightly point out, there are various forces who seek to undermine public schools. I, don't, I try hard not to read people's motives, but I can make a judgment on their actions. And I do think, as a personal opinion, this is very dangerous for the country because such things as maintaining our, our lead, maintaining our position as world leaders in science, and re particularly research science, that is science just for knowledge's sake, not just for applied science, is absolutely crucial to our future as we move into a world increasingly going to be dominated by artificial intelligence, such things as the robotization of, 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 of society. These things, we cannot maintain our position as, in, as world leadership and not continually be seeking to improve our overall education system and particularly our public schools. And I will say that I consider, I've said several times tonight, that I think this is a dangerous, a perilous time for our country. And one of the reasons it's a perilous time is because we, the public's mind in, in many cases has gotten muddled about the value of public schools. And I'll say once again, it's not any disrespect to other kinds of schools, but our public school system has been allowed to deteriorate, deteriorate over a long period of time. And we have to stop that, if you will, deterioration momentum, dig in and stop it, the momentum in that direction, and start building back to where American public schools are the world standard. Thank you. And last question. So I wanted to ask more of a question based off of um, the earlier millennial conversation we started with. Um, to build off of your trip with your grandson, uh, I share a lot of interest about what happened in the 1960s, a lot of the angst that happened then. And as a millennial with minimal history, what does someone who's lived through all this would say to go forward, to cut through all of the craziness? What's a focus that's reasonable we can look at? And what's an action everyday people can do to move forward? So sorry. So this is a question about moving forward. What is a focus that millennials like her can zero in on? And what, I've, I've now lost the second thing, I think it was an action. Oh, you're, you're still there. Reasonable daily, action. Reasonable daily action that they can do to help move things forward. Well, keep in mind, I'm gonna to try to answer the question, but keep in mind, please, ma'am, that what you're looking at- I'm not a man is, yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're looking at is, I'm a reporter who got lucky, who got very lucky. That's what I am, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a political scientist, but I am going to try to, to answer your question, that it's very important, perhaps now more than any other time in my lifetime, my own lifetime, with the possible exception of World War II, to ask that question of yourself every day. And I would suggest, it's just very respectfully suggest, the first thing is how can I help someone else? How can I help this, you know, one step, President Kennedy and his memorable inaugural address uh, when he was sworn in asked, made the statement, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. 
a reminder of that and then bring it down to the local level every day. What, I'm not gonna ask what my community can, can do for me, what my school, what the city government. I'm gonna ask what I can do for my neighbor. And I would add one thing, particularly in today's environment, if in saying to yourself, I wanna help one other person today, make that a goal of you, one other person today, if you can make that a person who is of different race than you, different religion than yourself, different ethnic background of yourself, that this, I, I, I'm convinced, will help you as a person, but it also is a contribution to your country. The other thing on a much broader scale, and we, again, we were reminded of it last Tuesday, the most powerful thing in a system of government such as ours is the ballot. That, <laughs> to vote, to do everything you can to get everybody else to vote is a major contribution to your country and will be for the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you very much. That question. Dan, or Mr. Rather, as everyone said, and they came up. But her question and your answer um, leads perfectly to the paragraph that I wanted to read from your book. You wrote in the chapter Courage on page 268. <laughs> Do not apologize or explain away your brand of patriotism. Do not sacrifice your ideals. Ultimately, democracy is an action more than a belief. The people's voice, your voice, must be heard for it to have an effect. Dan Rather and Elliot Kirshner, thank you very much for what unites us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, my brother. Thank you.